and uh, we are we have structured our presentation in the sense that we are just focusing on about six areas uh, that we think have some attention, and uh, uh, I'd like to emphasize is that this is not all that can be said. That we are trying to focus on areas that we really, uh, require special attention. So, Chairman, from the onset. I'd like to thank the steering committee on the implementation of the bill in previous to a United Kenya Task Force report for giving us an us as ANC party time during this validation forum to express ourselves on the CDI Task Force report. As Amani National Congress Party, we support the VBI objective of building bridges to a United Kenya in which we move from blood ties to nation of ideas. This is the dream that the founding fathers of our country had in mind when they coined the national country. However, I note that there are few challenges which the BBI process has encountered that must be addressed if it is to gain the confidence of Kenyans and achieve broad consensus. either by design or by default, that it is intended to serve the interests of a few individuals. It is important, therefore, that the committee reassures Kenyans that this process will be inclusive and ensure that the voice of Wanjiku, Mwenda, Akin, Nafula, Boke, Fatuma, Akai, Kijal, Roda, Atian, Nikorote, Nasirian, and Tibet are heard. To this effect, as ANC, we take exception to recurrent remarks by sections of the political class that certain parts and outcomes will come out of the BBI within certain timelines, whether Kenyans like it that way or not. Such remarks are reckless and should be discouraged. Besides, the impression created that the BBI process is intended to serve interests of a few. The other major challenge that the BBI process must address is fatigue associated with the culture of setting up commissions and task forces whose reports are never implemented but continue to gather dust on shelves or if implemented they are implemented partially. And for purposes of record, let me just highlight some of the reports. One, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission report. The Independent Review Commission on the General Elections held in Kenya on 27 December 2007, famously known as the Krizla Commission report. The Commission of Inquiry into the Illegal or Irregular Location of public land, that is the Lugun report, report of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Tribal Clashes in Kenya, of, uh, known as the Akumi Commission Inquiry report, report of the Parliamentary Select Committee to investigate ethnic clashes in western and other parts of Kenya in 1992, famously known as the Kiliko report, and the Commission of Inquiry into Post-Election Violence famously known as the Waki Commission Report. So, we ask ourselves this fundamental question. Will the BBI reports suffer the same thing? <coughs> Kenya's biggest challenge is not lack of sufficient reports, but a leadership deficit in which there is no political will and commitment to implement the reports of commissions or inquiries, committees and task forces. The public must reach a place where it holds its leaders accountable. Although the BBI conversation is partly a result of the quest for electoral justice, no effort has been made to revamp IABC to make it strong and truly independent. As presently constituted, IABC lacks the capacity and the necessary autonomy 
run its affairs in an as an independent body. For example, even with the simple task of procuring its election materials and technology, it has to go through the executive. Having laid the foundation, allow me to make substantive submissions on the BBI report and our position as a party. My presentation is structured under five thematic areas, namely electoral justice, peace and cohesion, the economy, environment and climate change, and governance. So let me start with the issue of electoral justice. Amani National Congress supports the principle of one man, one vote, and the equality of that vote. In order to achieve electoral justice in Kenya, we must be deliberate about making IBC autonomous and truly independent and with sufficient capacity to discharge her functions. Towards this end, there are other recommendations, such as obtained in the curricular report, that allow me to state key interventions that are needed. One, provide adequate funding to IBC to ensure that it performs its constitutional obligations, just like other commissions. The funding of IBC should be drawn directly from the consolidated fund to avoid executive mischief. Two, hold IBC accountable in its mandate, especially of continuous voter and civic education. This will clarify expectations, diffuse suspicions, <coughs> and empower the voter <coughs> to effectively carry out their civic duty. <coughs> Three, the composition and size of IBC should be drawn from qualified Kenyans with the requisite competencies and command the trust of Kenyans to deliver on free, fair, and credible elections. Four, IABC must be compelled to publish full election results within the election petition period as a measure. This includes the total number of registered voters, votes cast in favor of each candidate, spoiled votes, and other details that are usually not readily available. Let me move to the issue of peace and cohesion. Durable peace does not come automatically, but it is a product of social, economic, cultural, political, environmental, and religious justice. In order to achieve this, we propose the following. One, deal with impunity in which the rule of law has collapsed and people have become a law unto themselves without the restraining fear of consequences. Address the democracy deficit by ensuring that, that we do not build one bridge as we destroy others. Basically, we must not create an impression that you're bringing one community on board and at the same time evicting another community. Put closure to our painful past and use the lessons learned to build a stronger future for all of us. We cannot continue to dwell on the past. The future awaits us. <coughs> Let me come to the issue of the economy. And I will pose some rhetorical questions that are very fundamental. Is the economy working for Kenyans? Is it creating jobs for the Kenyan youth? Is it encouraging the farmer? Is the tax regime in Kenya fair to the common manager? These and many other questions are the ones that need to be answered if we are to achieve shared prosperity. Let me flag a few issues. <coughs> One, public debt management. ANC is gravely concerned that the country's state of, with the country's state of debt. 
This is the highest and most burdensome debt book in our history since independence, and it is almost unmanageable. There is an urgent need to re-examine our debt portfolio with a view of renegotiating the terms to favorable repayment terms. The relationship between the National Treasury and the Public Debt manager, Management Office, as it stands today, is incestuous. The latter ought to have a sense of independence and autonomy in the management of public debts and report to the public through Parliament on national debts, but under the current dispensation, this is not happening. It is half-hearted. So what do we propose as ANC? We propose that there should be the establishment of an independent public debt management authority with clear objects and functions, chief of which shall be managing public debt at national and county government levels. Mr. Chairman, I am happy to say that ANC is in the process of drafting legislation to implement this, and we ask the support <coughs> of the committee. <coughs> Two, we should put in place proper disclosure mechanisms where members of the public are periodically perhaps even religiously, informed on the state of public debt, the loan agreements, the terms of the loan, and the state of the loan. All these continue to be shrouded <coughs> in secrecy. And I'm sure all of you are now aware our public debt um, is running into <coughs> trillions of Kenya shillings. It has serious implications. Let me say something about the tax regime. ANC strongly feels that the tax regime has become punitive, extractive, and non-responsive to sparring economic growth and job creation. <coughs> this is fueled partly by corruption and the burdensome public debt I've talked about. As ANC, we recommend that the government should take deliberate steps in putting in place strategies for expanding the tax base, commensurate with the growth of the economy. Two, addressing the ease of doing business so that the economy can grow on a continuous basis. Three, wastage, corruption, and wastage in government. One of the main threats to an economy that works for all is corruption. Unfortunately, the fight against corruption has been hampered by weak institutional framework and lack of political goodwill. In order to address corruption, we propose the following. Ensure adequate funding to the judiciary and investigative offices and the offices of the prosecutor and other related uh, offices. Conduct continuous and random lifestyle audits. Three, strengthen the asset recovery mechanisms so that there is immediate but just seizure of any wealth that is not consistent with public declarations when returns are filed. This will improve the accuracy and quality of those returns. Mr. Chairman, let me just highlight, when we talk of the judiciary, for instance, you look at the numbers, maybe you've had access to them. Um, we are having cases, and I'm sure there are lawyers here like Paul Mwangi, where if you have an issue as a land case today, and you went to the land, the, the, the bench that deals with the land matters, 
they are likely to give you your hearing date or your mention date in the year 2021. Because you want to handle some land matter for your client. Now, this is a crisis. Land is an integral part of our economy. So if somebody who has a dispute or has an issue with a, a land matter, maybe the bank wants to have it as collateral and so forth, but you're being told you can have your first year in 2021. What are we telling Kenyans? These are very serious issues and they need to be addressed. That is why people are committing suicide uh, on some of these issues. Let me focus again on an issue that it just needs re-emphasizing because it already exists within the context of our constitution. Youth and job creation. Article 55 of the Constitution of Kenya states that the state shall take measures including affirmative action programs to ensure that the youth have access to relevant education and training, have opportunities to associate to be represented and participate in political, social, economic, and other spheres of life, access to employment, and are protected from harmful cultural practices. Mr. Chairman, this is an area that needs to be properly activated. Uh, we keep on hearing of funds, one after the other, the youth fund, the women fund, and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you still find that access to these funds is still not within the reach of the young people. This is something that needs to be seriously addressed. And these are what you might call administrative and policy-oriented aspects. They may not necessarily, uh, some may require additional legislation, but they need to be actualized. So we propose that the government enhances its programs of attachment and internship policy through the National Industrial Training Authority to prepare the youths for the job market. <coughs> the government initiates partnerships with the private sector to maximize opportunities for youth through deliberate incentives. This could be even uh, some, some tax uh, support programs uh, to allow companies to employ. If you employ a certain number of young people, maybe there can be a tax benefit that can be developed to allow the more companies to benefit from that tax and in the process to employ more young people. We must continue to mainstream youth affairs at political parties, at county governments, at national governments, actually in every aspect of leadership. We must also continue to nurture entrepreneurship among the youth. Mr. Chairman, it is disheartening when many graduates have been turned into border border uh, service providers. I'm not saying that there should be no transport at that level. But when you come across a graduate of physics, a graduate of mathematics, a graduate of chemistry, doing nothing else but actually on a border border, it is very disheartening. Mr. Chairman, Kenya's economy is largely agro-based, and there is need to ensure that the farmer is put at the center of all policy and strategy decisions. As ANC, we propose the following. The collapsed agro-processing industries ought to be revived and supported to protect the livelihoods of ordinary Kenyans. I'll give some examples, but I'm not limiting myself to that. We should not limit ourselves to that. But let's take the sugar industry as an example. This sector 
has been the major source of livelihood for about 25% of Kenya's populations, either directly or indirectly. Some of the sugarcane factories that need attention include Chemele, Mohoroni, Sony, Mumias, and Zoya. <coughs> In order to support the sector, some of the following steps need to be listed. I'll highlight one or two of them. Take deliberate steps to zone catchment areas for various public sugarcane factories, together with tracking systems and databases to be shared so that we institute penalties for those who engage in sugar poaching. And we have seen it has migrated from sugar, it used to be in coffee poaching whether it was poaching from Uganda through Chepkube or what happened to the coffee industry in the central Kenya region. Now it came to poaching of sugarcane. We have now seen that poaching of tea is beginning to grow. So clearly something is amiss and it's beginning to destroy our agricultural sector. Some of the debts will require to be written off to support these farmers. It makes no sense that we as Kenyans will subsidize power purchase agreements for people who are making us pay for electricity at very high levels because we are trying to subsidize them and we run away from subsidizing our farmers. When we look at our power bills, you ask yourself, are you living in a factory or are you living in a residence? Has it ever occurred to you it is because we are being made to subsidize power purchase agreements? A few people are making the kill. But we shy away from subsidizing the Kenyan farmer. We need to revisit the cooperative movement in this country. After all, what is the term Harambe at the end of the day? Harambe means pulling together. What was the cooperative movement all about? Pulling together, getting what you'd call a critical mass pulling together. Our cooperative sector is not doing well. It needs urgent attention. It was the foundation for small-scale savings and use of resources. We are equally exploring new areas of technology and also exploring areas like the blue economy. This is all very good and I think we should, as much as we deal with uh, some of the sectors that require revamping, we need to explore new others. So we are proposing that what we have as the Kenya Maritime Authority should also be broadened so that it can become the Kenya Maritime and Blue Economy Authority so that it can take over uh, and help in guiding the issues around uh, the Blue Economy. So in a nutshell, with our growing population and with the, demogra the demographics that we now know, that 70% of Kenyans are young and this is going to be a permanent future for a very long time, uh, we have to start positioning Kenya differently, not just as a market for imported products where we are now beginning to import eggs. We are importing milk powder, we are importing everything. We are importing second-hand clothes. We are importing virtually every consumable. We need to act on that. We support the BBI report 
for actually emphasizing that more resources uh, should be dedicated to development. And to do this, painful decisions will have to be taken. Uh, as I have said, um, some mega projects will have to be shelved for some time because the ratio in terms of what we have is something to worry about in terms of what we collect and what we propose or what we have been presenting as budgets to spend. We have been living a lie for a very long time. We are very clear that it would be important that um, when we look at regional blocks, and I'll say a little more to it when I come to governance, we, we should stick to those regional blocks as just that, regional economic blocks. Let's not try and create other bureaucracies around this. Creating economic synergies is a dynamic process and we need to encourage a situation where that happens and not try and create another burden on the taxpayer in this. Let me speak briefly to the fifth aspect and then I'll go to the last one. The, env the environment and climate change. Mr. Chairman, if you talk of shared prosperity, as you have done in your BBI report, page 69, under chapter 7, we are now very clear that climate change is real. Kenya is a country facing huge threats to its economic well-being as a result of climate change. Climate change has resulted in the interruption of individual and community livelihoods and economic downturn. This in turn is hampering inclusive economic growth and fueling social and political instability to resource conflicts and, and increasing conflicts on resources. <coughs> Therefore, the principle of sustainable development is embodied, as embodied in Article 10 of the Constitution. And Chapter 5 makes provisions on the land and environment. We need to see serious activation in this area to secure the future of the Kenyan people. For instance, we propose the development of a comprehensive framework for the realization of sustainable development in Kenya that ensures that the country effectively mitigates and adopts the realities of climate change. We propose the development of a comprehensive policy and legislative framework. If, there, if it is there, it needs to be strengthened that facilitates comprehensive measures in climate change adaptation and mitigation. Enforce environmental protection laws, especially in the face of rapid urbanization. Uh, it's by sheer coincidence, this is our proposal, but when you look at the headlines in the last few days, you look at what is happening in Lake Victoria, you look at what is happening in other areas, we are uh, in a crisis. Rural areas are becoming rapidly urban and there's a serious gap between that change, that shift, and what we are doing to deal with environmental issues. It is uh, a crisis. We propose that a proper environmental fund be set up to marshal resources towards environmental protection. This would include conservation of key water towers, increasing forest cover, and keeping the environment. We <coughs> are quick to quote what are called international standards when it comes to forest cover and what have you, but we are short when it comes to translating some of those international standards uh, to protect our environment. Mr. Chairman, let me come to the final component, governance. This is the, the one that looks easy on political platforms uh, because there are so many experts on matters of governance. 
So everybody who stands on a platform has his view, but sometimes they say what looks easiest becomes the most difficult uh, to deal with. Let me address myself to what we might call the proposed system of government. Mr. Chairman, the structure of the executive arm of government, government must uphold and respect the principle of one person, one vote. We, as ANC, are strictly opposed to any attempt to create multiple, conflicting, or ambiguous centers of state authority. The head of state must also be the head of government and commander-in-chief of the defense forces. The authority must not be shared or open to multiple interpretations Accordingly, therefore, we support the recommendation by the BBI report for the establishment of a national executive structure in which the executive comprises of a president, who is both the head of state and government, as well as commander-in-chief of the defense forces, a deputy president, a prime minister, who is appointed by the president from the president's party, subject to approval by parliament and the responsibilities of the Prime Minister must be clearly defined and safeguarded. And if need be, the Prime Minister can have a deputy or two deputies, but this needs to be clearly defined. Mr. Chairman, equally we support your proposal of the establishment of the office of the official leader of opposition with a shadow cabinet corresponding to the official cabinet and funded by the national exchequer. I think that was a very uh, rich proposal from the, in the BBI report. Now, I want to say something about what I've just said because <coughs> there's been talk about how good the grand coalition government was. But I want to be realistic because I lived it. Sometimes what is said is not what exactly happened. And I can tell you for free, for the Kenyans who may not know, that it reached a stage because roles were not properly defined. And the Grand Coalition government was a government that came out of necessity. We reached a stage where, when the Prime Minister was supposed to chair subcommittees of cabinet, if you are a PNU faction, sometimes they would feign commitment elsewhere. So we go, we are supposed to look at what is happening, and there's a very critical issue on the agenda. The minister responsible does not turn up. <coughs> if the minister responsible is not there, clearly you cannot discuss <coughs> the issue. Now this CISO went on. It weighed down the Prime Minister. <coughs> I and Uhuru were Deputy Prime Ministers. We were supposed to chair subcommittees sometimes on behalf of the Prime Minister. When he's not there, if Uhuru is not there, maybe the ODM ministers disappear. Sometimes when I chair, the PNU ministers disappear. So we developed a situation where there was always a lack of <coughs> quorum. These are the practical things that sometimes people may not know. And in the process, slowly, the whole ethos of cabinet and subcommittees of cabinet just dissipated. So this is why I'm emphasizing that the need for a very clear definition of the role of these offices as we propose them 
their limitations, their functionality, is something that needs to be looked at very, very critically. Otherwise, we will be creating a bureaucracy that will not be able to function. So this is a point that I leave with you. <coughs> and by the way, sometimes because the peers, the minister would suppo was supposed to come with the peers, the minister sometimes does not turn up but sends the peers. The peers then says, sorry, I don't sit in cabinet, I'm a technical person. So if the minister is not there, I cannot proceed. The minister sometimes comes, his peers is not there, and he says, this is a technical issue. If my peers is not there, I cannot offer help. So these were the, no, that is filibustering. So let us create a structure where there shall be no filibustering when it comes to the responsibility that we owe the Kenyan public. Mr. Chairman, I want to get in closer to the end. I want to state that as ANC, we fully support your proposal that the 47 counties remain as they are. We have reached a stage where people have been given their counties. <coughs> and again, to take it away uh, may not be very wise. Let us develop mechanisms of enhancing efficiency going forward, but let us not take away the counties as they are. Mr. Chairman, we are very categorical that as ANC we are against the introduction of a third tier of government, as has been suggested by some BBI popularization public rallies or some speakers at those rallies. We cannot afford to burden Kenyans with another tier of government. We recommend that the Schedule 4 of the Constitution, which deals with unbundling, classification, and the issues of functions, be implemented to the letter because this is not happening, and it's undermining devolution. One such example is in education, where functions such as infrastructure in both primary and secondary schools, such as classrooms, labs, toilets, and teachers' houses, should be assigned to county governments. We also want to emphasize that we should entrench the principle of funds follow functions. We note that while this principle has been inscribed in the Constitution of Kenya, 2010. It has not always been adhered to. The national government has stood in the way of funds following functions. This is the case, for instance, in the health, roads and water sector. It should be an offense for anyone to stand in the way of funds following functions. And ladies and gentlemen of uh, the steering committee, it may be interesting for you to note that the budget of the Ministry of Health at the national government continues to grow and yet functions of health are supposed to be devolved. These are very interesting contradictions <coughs> and this is why we are having serious controversies about controversy I mean procurement in the Ministry of Health. Right at the national level, there are a lot of issues now before the Senate committee and others, and the Public Accounts Committee about procurement because the national government does not want to let go in accordance with the Constitution. So who is benefiting from this procurement that is being retained at the center?
we support the BBI's recommendation that a minimum of 35% of resources or the revenue that is collected based on the formula for revenue allocation. Um, it is now stands at a minimum of 15%, but it's logical that this be upped and in the BBI report you make such a recommendation. Um, there are a few issues about borrowing, but that you will read in the document. Let me come to an issue that is perhaps going to be very interesting, but if it is not said, and if it is not safeguarded, we may be putting the country into a precarious position. Term limits and security. As ends, <laughs> We propose that the security of tenure and term limits of all public and constitutional officers must be strictly protected and respected. And Mr. Chairman, I will highlight a few, but not all. Some of these offices include the Inspector General, the DPP, the Ombudsman, the Governor of the Central Bank, the Attorney General, the Auditor General, the Controller of Budget, the IBC Chairman and Commissioners, the EACC, the Solicitor General, the Chief Justice and President of the Judiciary, as well as those of the County Governors and the National Executive. I appeal to Kenyans and to you as a committee, there should be no attempt to create new guises for these officers, both during the life of the tenure and after the tenure of any one of the state officers in charge for the time being. Mr. Chairman, that is a very serious message to the people of Kenya. Let me come to the issue of gender issues. As ANC, because of limited time, but in due course, uh, I don't think we are time bad in making some additional written submissions to yourselves. As ANC, we recommend that the gains made by women and persons with disabilities should be enhanced. Every effort should be undertaken to address the barriers that hinder more women and persons with disabilities from participating in electoral processes. This includes campaign financing, capacity building, and party lists. Mr. Chairman, I come back to this because even part of the crisis that we see in our electoral system is because certain quarters of the country feel underprivileged and others use their position to, to gain leverage against others. But, so something needs to be uh, looked at here. Finally, I want to say that we have raised pertinent issues which require sober engagement as Kenyans. And we should identify a trajectory of transformation in which we build bridges to a united Kenya, a nation of, so that we have a nation of ideals and do away with a nation of blood ties. Mr. Chairman, we rest our case as ANC and we say thank you for according us your ears. So now, 
we have submitted the written document to you. I don't know how we proceed thereafter. Asante Nisana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, NC party leader. Uh, normally, the way we proceed is that uh, we pose some questions and seek clarifications. And should you feel that members of your team need to speak on some of the questions or clarifications, be free to delegate to them. Uh, while we were doing the introduction, in this phase, we have also gotten some technical members to help us in uh, this validation process. I'll just introduce them so that if you see them asking a question, we don't wonder who they are. For today, we have Joy Mdivo, just carry your hand. We have Kendra Teach, just carry your hand. We have Deva Nyona, just carry your hand. And we have Julia Sokara. Uh, tomorrow we'll have different ones, so if you watch television tomorrow and you see different ones, don't wonder which ones are they. So I usually start from the steering committee members, and as I Yeah, uh, Honorable Mama Subu from Samburu came while you were presenting. Just carry your hand. She's a member of the steering committee. So I'll start, then I'll give some members, and maybe we may might take five questions at a time, then we'll have a final round. My first, I have a couple of questions. When you talk of IEBC and its autonomy, and we know that IEBC is part of the Chapter 15 commissions, where you have several commissions there, nearly 10, 12 of them. What you're suggesting of, of IEBC, are you also suggesting it for the other commissions? Because the constitutional provisions on IEBC are guided by that chapter. So should we take it that whatever you are proposing for IEBC should apply to JSC, should apply to Management of the Service Commission, should apply to Parliamentary Service Commission, should apply to DSCC, and so on. We might want a clarification on that. Number two is uh, just to correct one thing in your paper, uh, especially page 12, where you are talking of us having recommended regional governments at 4.4. I think that's not right. It's what you stated 4.5 in terms of creating a regulatory framework for the regional blocks. That's what is in the report. So that should just be corrected. Uh, number three, that uh, I thought uh, we should seek a clarification from you. Uh, you have just stated that from your practical experience, in the coalition government that you have given us a live example of how chairing those committee meetings was an issue because of the divide in that coalition government. You have gone ahead again and stated that uh, the prime minister should be appointed for the president party. Given your experience in the coalition government, let's use the same example. If the Prime Minister was to be appointed, if that was to replicate itself in the 2022 elections, let's say, what happened in 2007, where the party with the majority didn't have the presidency, and you are appointing the Prime Minister from the President's party, and the opposition has the majority, and this Prime Minister from the President's party has to be approved by Parliament. Would the same practical example you are talking about happen that the majority opposition party would keep on not approving the president's appointee if the 247 was to replicate that? Maybe you can just give us a clarification how you would deal with such a situation given that you have recommended that the prime minister must come from the president's party, irrespective of whether the president's party has the majority power. Yet has to be approved. So, I think mine is more to seek your political advice on three things. Uh, one on in page six, you talk of supporting the principle of one man and one vote, and 
and the equality of that world. And, and during the time we went round, we met various regions that said that they were underrepresented. If, if we were to cure that, it, it, how, or rather, how would we cure that without either having to diminish the representation of those who are considered overrepresented, or without having to add constituencies in order to in, increase the representation of those who feel underrepresented. If we were to ensure that there was actually one, is it possible to ensure that there is one man, one vote without having to diminish or increase constituencies? And from your political experience, uh, is it possible where we are now in, in Kenya today to increase constituencies, increase the number of uh, representation in, in the houses? Uh, secondly, on, on the issue of the economy, in our report we had talked about revolutionizing the economy. And we said that uh, the economy that we have now is, is not going to work and, and is not helping us. When it comes to agriculture, is it possible to uh, totally revolutionize agriculture? For instance, there are people who have thought that we possibly need to stop uh, planting sugar or planting maize and possibly go to other crops. Is, is, uh, do you think that's politically possible? Should we possibly move from sugar to palm oil, and possibly move from uh, maize to, uh, to nuts and other indigenous foods, and, and possibly uh, even for cash crops? Is it possible to possibly move from into cash crops that are, would possibly be more relevant now, like uh, pyrethrum or cotton? Uh, thirdly, I, I was going to touch uh, on, on what uh, Vice Chair has also talked about in, in respect of governance. Um, but I, I'm wondering whether you say it from the President's party as, as distinguished from whether it was a statement against appointment from the majority party. Uh, so, so that it's, it's how would it work uh, when the person comes from a President's party uh, where that party is, is the minority. And uh, I also, I, I served as a legal advisor to the Prime Minister at that time, and I did see firsthand a lot of that, uh, what you're talking about, where the, the technical civil service that is appointed from the President's side appears to be the mainstream civil service, while the President that serves a Prime Minister who is not, who has come from a majority party that is not in government appears to be the peripheral civil service, and, and those conflicts continue throughout. Uh, so that that is the argument against having a prime minister who is not for the president's party. But the argument again against the prime minister from the president's party is that when they're in the minority, then they cannot work in parliament. So how politically do we resolve that problem? <laughs> Last one, then you know. oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Honorable <clears throat> I'll raise two points. They are not weighty, but uh, I, I, I really feel you should make a clarification there. One is, again, on following on the economy. Our economy is agroeconomy. And you talked about support of uh, sugar, cotton, maize, you name it. And you know that for a long time, including the time you yourself were in the realm of leadership in this country, we had the support of the parastatos where it became an endless pit, putting money there, is being taken out, misused, mishandled, dished out at wish. And I didn't hear you link it to the cartels which we have talked about in our report, which could go to a certain extent into the destruction of the money you put there, which is the board, and therefore it becomes a wastage. 
I, I, I wonder what you have critically to say about that, because we have had it, we have seen it, we have grown through it, we know it. Number two, we are touching on our first century of government. And we were never meant to invent the wheel. And I like the way you talked about the bureaucratic model. If you link that with our education, both, and we have produced in that century, economists, educationists, policy makers, you name them, we have had the best. If you do a mathematical analysis, you have lots and lots of numbers of every discipline. And yet we are still in that bureaucratic matter. I wonder what you yourself have to say, again, as a person who has held the highest position, perhaps, or close to the highest position in this country at a time when you were the VP and I think uh, Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try and uh, uh, make some comments, and then I'll uh, request that uh, Honourable Sakwa Bunyasi uh, can uh, address that. Elliot um, and Baron, and then at the next bout, maybe I can pick somebody else to to, to chip in. First of all, on the issue of the IBC and uh, those commissions, I just want to be. Uh, very clear here that you know we have not been implementing the law we ask ourselves why for instance and it may seem laughable but <laughs> if um, the IBC wanted to procure ICT services They are the user, but they will be told to secure ICT facilities. You will have to go through the Ministry of ICT. Can you tell me what happens in that chain? To put it bluntly, I don't know whether they would answer it, but assuming you went back to the election petition, the presidential election petition, and you asked IBC who actually secured the services of the fellows who didn't want to open the server. Was it the IBC directly, or was it done from another quarter? Now, I'm posing this as very critical question that if we indeed want to create independent institutions like the IBC and, and a few others that are listed in the area that you mentioned, let us then give it a very critical view as Kenyan people and see whether there was wisdom in having all of them there or some did not be there. But there are others that have what you would call a mega footprint on the people of Kenya, depending on how they conduct themselves. An electoral body has a mega footprint or impact on the people of Kenya if what they generate or produce does not reflect the will of the people of Kenya. So these are fundamental questions, and I hope it helps in some clarification on that uh, particular issue. The issue about the Prime Minister, this is my view. Uh, there could be other views even from my colleagues. We have debated, but I always say there's always one person with a better idea than yourself. Uh, when it comes to the Prime Minister coming from um, the President's party, or appointed by the President, I'm coming from the position that do we want to have a democratic system that recognizes the opposition or not. 
This is the fundamental question that we must ask, answer ourselves. If I'm the candidate for ANC and I'm competing against the chairman, Adam Zolo, and Adam Zolo wins. Now, if Adam Zolo appoints me as his prime minister, so who becomes the leader of the opposition? So, yeah. you know, these are questions. I, I may not have the answers here, but these are the questions that you as our experts and others who will be working with you must completely dig into this so that we are clear that if that is going to happen, what then are the parameters of post-election coalitions? I am in a coalition called NASA, but the coalition we have is a pre-election coalition. So what happens if indeed there is a party with a majority there and the president's party does not necessarily have the majority but is obligated to do it? Then what kind of coalition arrangements should we structure in the context of the political scenario that is unfolding in our eyes uh, to go to the future? So again, I'm raising that as an issue. Um, let me also flag something, although it's not in our document, but Paul Mangi raised the issue of one man, one vote, the equality of the vote. Um, there's of course a school of thought that says maybe Kenya should consider the South African model, mixed member uh, representation. Um, and there they have both constituencies and they also have this other aspect which they can develop. It's also an issue. But one thing about the South African one, which I think is positive, is that in the South African arrangement, there's no conflict or there are no multiple centers of power. We are Africans, gentlemen and ladies. And I'm not trying to be conservative, but I'm trying to be very <laughs> realistic. And Mwangi, you know what I'm talking about. If we want to be realistic, then either we bite the bullet and adopt something similar to uh, the South African one, or if not, we do it but tailor it so that even the hybrid system that we are proposing here uh, can be useful <coughs> to the Kenyan people. Um, if I come to the economy, uh, um, true uh, to, to Bishop Njenga, I, I agree with you that um, we have had very serious challenges in the agricultural sector. We require diversification, no doubt about it. We also need to embrace modern methods of, of uh, crop husbandry. These are very critical issues that we ought uh, to look at. Um, but I would want to say that we should not run away from sugar because macadamia has come or so forth. That should be really an economic decision. What has ailed the sugar industry in Kenya? is not an economic decision made by the farmer. It is visitation of corruption activities that have suppressed that farmer. Let's look at our neighbor Uganda. Uganda was a country in perpetual conflict from the days of Idi Amin and others. Their sugar industries died. Kakira sugar industry died and uh, the other sugar industries they had there. So for years, Uganda had no sugar, could not produce sugar, had no sugar farms. The reality is that Kakira Sugar Factory is now producing sugar from a completely devastated nation and economy, a war-ravaged economy. 
they're producing sugar and now even exporting sugar to us. So my point here is that this, the tragedy in the sugar industry, in the coffee industry, and what is going into the tea industry and others that is beginning to cause havoc is more of what you'd call disjointed policy implementation and corruption cartels that you, are, you have highlighted very accurately that are beginning to act. So there's nothing wrong in having some parastatals dedicated to some of these sectors. When you go to the sugar industry, when you had the Sugar Development Levy Fund, it was dedicated to sugar, <coughs> and it would fund sugar, research, and so forth. Since we went into this other amorphous body, the big one, we have a problem in the agricultural sector. We had coffee research funded by proceeds from coffee, dedicated to coffee. We are having problems in conducting research. In fact, the only agricultural entity that is funding its own research is actually tea, as we speak at this point in time. So that may need a revisitation. So we may look at legislation. It may not be a constitutional issue there, but legislation and policy. And I know you also have to make recommendations on what can be dealt with administratively and what can be dealt with legislation and what requires constitutional amendments. Um, I think I will end there. Well, did I miss something? No, you did not. Uh, we can have another round of three. <laughs> but uh, maybe oh, Sato okay. wants to add something oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I just Can you give me the I just focus on the issues related to agriculture, economic growth, and uh, that kind of management. Um, we have been dismissive, for example, of uh, some crops like uh, uh, sugar cane. Uh, we have uh, gone to sleep about uh, crops like maize. We almost think we should uh, diversify out of them. Uh, we have had such problems in coffee. People are beginning to think that, you know, um, coffee, maybe because of labor costs and other reasons, we are not going to, we are going to have uh, an impact on that. Uh, but I think that these are decisions that are being made quickly, hastily. Um, when we, we know that when one crop or line of activity ceases to make a return, farmers should transition out of it, for example. But transitions need to be managed and supported on the supply chain, not single interventions at one node, but on the supply chain. And when you do that, it happens in all countries, uh, even developed countries today, uh, you do that, then you, 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 you facilitate that transitioning and farmers will go into it or not go into it depending on whether it pays or not. Two, I think a very clear case is they need to link these uh, 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 actions, these micro actions along the value chain with trade. And I think it's most clear to us uh, in maize how, how we import at high cost when farmers can't even get shelter to, to keep their maize uh, within the, in, 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 uh, in the maize growing zones and so on. I think it's usually a scandal almost every other year, if not every year. Those are deliberate mistakes that should, in fact, be, I would say, that macro... Uh, 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 crimes that we commit, but because it's normally the establishment or people with power that do that, nobody ever puts them uh, before a court of law and so on. We can't manage these transitions. They, even when we liberalize, parastatals don't become irrelevant. They should change their roles as parastatals, not to frustrate the private sector, but to guard. For example, there may be distributional issues uh, when you allow uh, free enterprise. Who gains, who loses? Uh, in terms of uh, demographics or regions. Prostitutes can help to point uh, to uh, what areas, how to stabilize them. So I think that the management of the economy should go back uh, like we were, I would say, in the golden year of Kenya, in the 1970s, when uh, uh, planning was producing results. I think now it's free for all, and it's free for all for personal gain. And we shall not grow unless the, economic, unless the agricultural sector grows. 
And this natural resource, natural resource base is, is expanded, like the blue economy, for example. Uh, if, we, if we ignore how to use those natural resources, we can't grow. We can't be a Japan. Japan became what it is because of the, uh, the need to stabilize them after the Second War. And they had their goods entering the U.S. market completely and he had a huge market at Europe. And it was a required acceptance of Japanese goods to help them get out of mischief. So we can't use that model of rapid growth without a strong national resource base. We have a resource base, and I think the, uh, my party leader's position is that we should go back to sane economic management to be able to help this country. Before we move away from okay. this point, I want to say something about the proposed third tier. Now, it is important, Mr. Chairman, to emphasize that the, the rationale for the establishment of the regional economic blocks is to enable them to uh, exploit their full potential based on the comparative advantages by coming together so that they enjoy economies of scale also, and also maximize the utilization of shared resources. There is no lacuna in the administrative setup of the county governments as they exist today. So the argument should not be that the counties are two smaller entities that we need to manage them from a higher level by the creation of the third tier level of government. You know, Elliot, you are answering to something that is not in our report. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just responding. Because we are validating our report. No, it's an imagining issue which you can't wish away because that's the argument which is being advanced in political rallies today. And we can't wish it away because it will creep into your initial report or it will come in as a new suggestion before you come up with your final report. So it is important that we look at it from that context. So the rationale is not that we need to create or manage the countries from a higher level. If you are going to create regional uh, government. You are, it's basically a duplicity of effort because the county governments are already coming together in the form of regional economic blocks. What we should be addressing, as you correctly put it in your report, is to have an enabling policy and regulatory framework to facilitate operationalization of the regional economic blocks, not to create a third tier of government through the proposed regional governments. And just for your information, and I'm sure you are aware of this, the perception in the public domain is that this third tier uh, government is being advanced to take care of the interest of governors who are serving their second terms. Just to pose a question, what are we reward, uh, about to reward these governors for? For bad governance? <laughs> I mean, at the expense of the taxpayer, taxpayer it's mind-boggling actually. So that's one issue. Then another issue we need to look at the fundamental principle on the basis of which this steering committee and its predecessor, the task force, uh, was anchored was the issue of perhaps lack of inclusivity. We need to widen our understanding and context of inclusivity so that we don't just look at it from the issue of the executive. That if we widen the executive and accommodate three, four individuals from perhaps those three, four communities, then we have got inclusivity. No. We need to widen our interpretation of inclusivity to entail a situation that would facilitate impartial and equitable access to opportunities and equitable distribution of national wealth. For the benefit of the Kenyan people. That is what inclusivity is all about. And this is the fundamental problem we have been facing in this country since independence. So it's not a question of bringing three, four, five people from different communities. Then you say you have inclusivity. What happens to the, to the communities from the other 40 tribes of Kenya? So let us look at inclusivity from the perspective of impartial and indiscriminate access to resources, opportunities, and equitable distribution of national wealth. So that we are not having the current prevailing situation where we have economic growth. We are being told the economy is growing at 6%. The income per capita of the country is increasing, yet we are only witnessing a, a rise in the standards of living of the ruling elite. We want to see a fundamental change in the disposable, disposable incomes of the Kenyan people. Okay. Very well. uh, we go for the next last three or four questions, but let me recognize the presence of Honorable Jeremiah Kioni. I know or I presume 
that you are here because you had a committee related to this matter. But I also know that you are once a running mate a of Honorable <laughs> <friend of Ramsey. laughs> But I don't think you have defected, but uh, I recognize your presence. We shall have another three questions. Let's start with Archbishop, then Attorney General Emeritus, Florence, Ken, and Joy. Those, and we finish. Make it very brisk, because we are running out of time. I listened carefully to your suggestion around corruption. <clears throat> but what you said mainly was that you were wasted in government. And to me, from what the last speaker has been saying, we need to have positive ways of approaching finance and the wealth of this country. In a positive way, if you can show us, in which both the revenues of the, of the country, the resources of this country, the investment from international donors and World Bank and this, are put in such a point that we are able to say, yes, now that we are leaving corruption, we are moving towards now sustainability. And I think also when people get in there or a law or make a or whatever you want to So I think that it's very important for me to see this, this corruption, you know, is from your uh, 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 explanation. I even feel that you, sh you should have given us more of the ways and means in which now we can positively get away from, from corruption. Because from what we know, um, this the economic country has billions and billions and billions which have been wasted. And they are huge. But how do we turn these billions and billions now to come to be for the development of every citizen? That is the city. Any general emeritus? Th thank you very much. We welcome you to the steering committee. And I personally am very happy you have come. Because it does appear that quite a number of your ideas are ideas which are already uh, in our report. Uh, just a, one or two questions. You state that you are in, in the process of drafting legislation to implement uh, the independent debt, public debt management authority. Uh, what are the timelines for that? Number two, the issue that has been raised by Owalo, the issue of inclusivity. My own perception, personal, is that if our current constitution was properly implemented, letter and spirit, uh, then uh, the issue of inclu inclusion will not be there. Because we have more than 16 sections in the constitution which say that in the cabinet must reflect the face of Kenya, in the armed forces must reflect the face of Kenya. Uh, and devolution, of course, is there to ensure that uh, everybody benefits from uh, in inclusive, you know, economic resources and so on. So it is there, which leads me to what uh, the party leader said, uh, it, some deficit. People do not trust the government, that the government will uh, implement these things, which leads me to what uh, Archbishop here is talking about, the national ethos. I would want to hear more from you on how we can create a national ethos in this country which, under which the constitution and the legislation can be implemented, not just the letter but also the spirit, because it appears to me that may be an answer to most of the problems that we are having today, lack of implementation of what is already, already there. Three. IEBC, you state at two, paragraph two, three. Huh? Two, three. Quite rightly so, uh, that the composition and the size of IEBC should be drawn from qualified Kenyans with the requisite competencies that command the trust of Kenyans. Uh, now, the issue, as far as I can see, which we had yet have to address, and we would like to have your opinion on this, is how are these Kenyans 
to be found and to be appointed. We have tried a system of uh, public advertising. People apply, they are interviewed by a panel of drawn from various sectors of, of, of the society, religious organizations, lawyers, what not, and so on. But we have not succeeded. Uh, we have also, after independence, really, the president was appointing. But it was not just appointing out of the blue. I know as a fact that uh, in 1992, the president appointed from the nominees of political parties. And how he did that, he did not just appoint anybody. He told political parties that I want your list of nominees, just for who, whom I can choose, your list of nominees who fit a certain criteria, a criteria of not being a political activist, not being a partisan, not holding a position in a political party, but the nominees whom you feel uh, have, the, uh, have the integrity and have the, uh, the wherewithal to be able to deliver fairness and that people also trust them. And let me tell you, when all these political parties then in the opposition submitted their nominees to me, yeah, and each one of them, you know, Matiba submitted, Jaramogu uh, Dingo Dinga submitted, Mwai Kibaki submitted, and so on. It was so easy for President Moi to appoint uh, names. We just looked at those names which were common in all the lists. And there were four names which were common in all those lists. And we just appointed those. And we never had any problem after that, as far as that particular issue is concerned. So the issue to me is... We would like to know from your other political party ANC. I mean, which method can we use to have such those type of people on the commission? Not people who, who would go there to fight for ANC, but people who would be there taking into account the wider interests uh, of the community. The last one is the issue of, uh, as you have rightly stated, the multiple centers of power. I believe that when we Crafted the Prime Minister, and we said that the Prime Minister can be sacked by the uh, President subject to the approval of Parliament and so on. It was a way of not having two senders of one in the Presidency and another one in the Prime Minister. Because, we, as you st rightly stated, what, we must always have one center of power, particularly in the African way of uh, governance. Now, my question to you. We don't have to answer it, by the way. Uh, you can think about it. Is this, should we also apply the same criteria that we apply to the Prime Minister? Should that also be applied to the Deputy President? Because I've had now some feeling people saying that because of the system that now exists, it appears that uh, the Deputy President can also be a center of power, particularly when the President is serving the second term and that should be avoided. Do you think it's a problem or should we leave it the way it is? Uh, you know, you cannot stop an attorney general that I've served for 20 years. But the rest, one question each. Florence, one. Joy, one. Ken, one. Ask two, ask two because you're a steering committee member. <laughs>
Joy, one question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, mine is actually uh, on the bottom in general, and Madam Florence have sort of touched on it. It's on the debt management authority. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have as a proposal. But I would like to find out how you intend on going around the perennial issue of authorities still being beholden to the National Assembly. As it is, the National Assembly is the one with the, with the responsibility to check the excesses of the executive. And it is upon them to also pass laws, for example, regarding the debt ceiling. And we have seen that the National Assembly is failing in its duty. Would we not be uh, better served in trying to find a way to get the National Assembly to play its oversight role, for which it has been instituted, rather than creating an authority which will still need funds and facilitation from the same National Assembly for it to execute its mandate. How are we going to manage the dynamics of having some people who are outside the National Assembly, beholden to the National Assembly, carrying out a function that's supposed to be primarily the National Assembly? Ken? Party leader, that is a youth, so maybe that one you handle and you can delegate the others because the youth constituency always wants to be addressed by the big men. No. Um, I think these are very good questions and um, they'll call for protracted debate. But in order to quickly help, I'll make a disclosure here on the issue of debt. I would like uh, Saab Kwabunyasi to respond to that issue of public debt um, for very good reasons. Uh, he can pronounce why. But uh, he's an economist. Uh, he has worked with the World Bank, apart from being uh, an MP, so he's a treasury man. Uh, over and above that, uh, he's leading uh, our initiative on matters of dealing with public debt. But please, you can uh, expound on that, and then I'll come back to the other. Thank you, uh, uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I'm glad that there is uh, going to be quite a bit of interest in the issues of public debt management. Um, there are countries that have uh, uh, developed mechanisms to give a, a relevant of autonomy on the decision or the level of debt relative to the size and performance of the economy. The reason is why, why that is usually separate, it's not under the state, of course, and it's still under the state but not under treasury, as it were. Treasury takes it as a given to plug into the way it's planning. The reason is that uh, the level of debt can be varied usually on the upside by the appetite of regimes in power. And this is not unique uh, to Africa or to Kenya. It's, it's generally a matter that is uh, uh, of general concern in the, the, the developing and the developed world. The intent of having a, a public debt management authority would be this entity that is able to, on the basis of their perception of the level and performance of economic growth, to determine an op optimal debt level that is sustainable within that economy. I think uh, we don't need to go into uh, 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 a lot of details on this, but just to say that even though every country needs debt, Every individual needs debt, uh, even the billionaires are borrowing and so on. But there is a level of borrowing that is sustainable. And if you leave that decision within the revenue collectors and the spenders, uh, I think it doesn't work very well. Now, the issue has been, why does the parliament uh, oversight this? Most of our debt has been created when the budget is approved. <laughs> and as you know, in this country, we have reached a point where you think a big budget is a good thing, always. We even have shown examples of what's the size of the rest of the East Africa community combined relative to Kenya. And we come out proudly to say it's barely between half and 60% of it. Therefore, we are doing very well, we are a big economy. But, so these, uh, uh, I think, great passion in the pursuit of the size of, of debt 
to grow the economy in ways that you can sustain it is what needs to be managed. And we are working on uh, proposals. We have looked at various examples. I'm not going to all those now. When we put them officially into the screen, it's going to be subject to a lot of debate and discussion. But I think it's extremely important that in respect of debt, which has the potential to damage the economy substantially, in ways that uh, 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 we only see when we face inflation, when, you say, uh, when we face uh, issues of inability to, to pay both our medical expense education and our external debt service, for example. When our coffee earnings for, for export earnings that uh, we would come in to support the rest of this economy are now devoted to monetizing the foreign exchange, that little which we have collected in order to pay debt. Or borrowing from Tom to pay Peter. There are many, many factors that are critical. Now, this will not be out of control of the state, but it will be an institution of the state that supports the efforts that Treasury does by forcing Treasury to make hard decisions on how and at what rate we grow our expenditures. KRA, for example, used to be a department inside uh, the Treasury, remember at one time? Now it's quasi, it's not quite independent, but it's quasi autonomous. I think that there's room for further improvement there. The public debt management uh, one also, uh, this one needs to be not just quasi autonomous, it needs to be truly autonomous to be able to, to, to guide the pace at which you are going to grow your expenditures where you can't raise the revenue and support there. Uh, there's a proposal that uh, uh, we are working on and we are consulting uh, widely. It will soon enter the mainstream, I mean the, uh, the, the, the legal, the parliamentary process very shortly, perhaps within the uh, month of, uh, before mid-March or within the month of March, it will have probably reached there. There's a lot of wide consultation that is being, being undertaken. Um, I'll uh, request uh, Barak to talk about national ethos. Thank you, Party Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you are distinguished uh, panel. Ethos, uh, Mr. Chairman, as we know, are a factor of uh, education. Regardless that uh, it is education that is institutionalized in the academies or that it is education at the civic level, it is a matter of the kind of uh, human being that we are trying to mold. It's not even something that uh, we can legislate and prefecture through legislation. It's a question of how we make people think and feel about themselves. Progressively, we have evolved into a society that celebrates theft, grand larceny, which we euphemize as corruption. The role models that we are giving to our children today are about <laughs> stealing. We wonder sometimes why children want to steal examinations, for example. It's basically because they know that the school system and the passage through the youthful stages of life is preparing them to graduate into a society where only thieves excel. And therefore, they might as well begin by demonstrating that they can steal that which is closest to them and which is an exam. <laughs> when they have finished with that, they will come out and continue stealing. We must be able to migrate from that paradigm to a new paradigm that demonizes, as indeed it should, the culture of grand larceny, the culture of uh, stealing. That uh, we saw a research a few years ago that indicated that up to 65% of uh, young people aged between 18 and 35 indicated that if they got the opportunity to steal, they would do so. And they thought there was nothing wrong with stealing. Now that is a fundamental problem. Why are people appointed into government today? People are appointed into government, number one, because they are homeboys and homegirls. 
But to be a homeboy and a homegirl is not good enough. You must also be corruption compliant. Otherwise, you don't qualify to be appointed just by the fact that you are a homeboy or a homegirl. So if you get there and you are not doing what you are supposed to be doing, they show you the door. The IEBC has got a fundamental job within its education division to continuously educate us on leadership, on leadership qualities, on the kind of leader we want, on the kind of elected person that we want. We have had the question raised here, for example, about parliament. And we have been asked, why do we want to migrate the question of uh, debt management and monitoring from parliament to another body? And it is true, and with most preponderant respect to legislation in Kenya and elsewhere in the world, that it is true that we also have people who may actually qualify to be called honorable criminals. <laughs> that the quality of parliament is very important. And you know, when we tried to come up with uh, caveats about uh, who can be allowed to contest for parliament, Parliament itself watered that down in this country and removed all those uh, caveats and all those hurdles. So we probably need another institution that is going to deal with that. And the cultural ethos, therefore, from another level, must be taken back to school, to the academies. The children must learn the pride of, uh, of, of, of knowledge, uh, honorable uh, Attorney General Emeritus knows that uh, we went to school in days when there was uh, a lot of satisfaction in just knowing, harvesting, gathering, storing, and processing knowledge from whichever sources without uh, bothering about uh, whether the knowledge was going to make you a very rich person or not. We must get back to that and so for the society it goes back to IBC continuous education not this thing which they do in the last two weeks of uh, uh, the electoral period and they say oh this is where to put your tick on the card people know that already but do they know why they are electing leaders uh, it's a bigger question than that but uh, in footnote context I think that could suffice for now thank you very much Mr. Chairman Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we are winding up. Yes. Um, I just want to say that um, uh, uh, Attorney General um, Emeritus, you, you said some vital things, but we must always also ponder if India, and I'm sure you have these examples with you and many others, if India with uh, a voter base of almost 700 uh, billion, not the overall population, but the voter base of about 700 uh, million people, sorry. They have only three commissioners to conduct their, yeah. their election. Over these years, India has only maintained three commissioners. How many political parties do we have in India? We have hundreds. So who then appoints the commissioners in India? Those three, how are they identified? Is it something we can, we can borrow and figure out uh, if India has got that kind of population? They have had elections for longer than us. They have had only three people conducting those elections. What are they doing <coughs> that we can <coughs> do? So that is an issue. So the, I'm also saying that it's not necessarily <coughs> always correct that political parties would be the one to appoint or parliamentary political parties should be the one to nominate because if India has more, uh, what can we learn from them, the largest democracy? Um, there's there's uh, another issue you did raise about 
uh, what happens uh, when you are saddled uh, as a leader <laughs> with uh, somebody either on your ticket uh, or not on your ticket, but you're saddled with him and you're having a lot of challenges in dealing with the, the person. That's the fundamental question that we should ask, that what, ki what is the architecture that we require as a Kenyan people um, to be able to deal with these kind of concerns uh, without, of course, rubbishing uh, the, 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 the people who hold those offices. Uh, I think it's something that needs deeper, uh, deeper reflection. Um, uh, and, and finally, uh, uh, to Archbishop Okoth, I think um, the, the, the issues you have raised around um, corruption are so deep. Um, some have been touched on by my colleagues here. Uh, but I, I keep on going back to um, the judiciary as an example. Um, because according to what I have come to understand, the, the largest uh, litigant anywhere globally is usually the state, either litigant or defendant. That is, somebody somewhere is filing a case against a government department in one way or, or the other. And cases have taken long uh, and they're not resolved. But if we go back just a little bit, was it Kim Warer uh, Dam as an example? Uh, they say seven billion was lost, or thereabouts, or eight billion. I can assure you, if you had given the judiciary seven billion or eight billion, by now they should have automated all their proceedings so that we don't have to wait for all that time. Because justice delayed is justice denied. And this is where we are having even with corruption cases. They go in there and they are stuck. Look at the appeal court. Today, if you have a case in the coastal region, you'll be shuttling between Malindi and and I don't know Mombasa, depending on when the appeal court is going to sit. If you are in Western Kenya, you'll be shuttling between Eldoret and Kisumu. Because they sit only in specific places, specific times. So what are we doing? We are, through this, our, our, our policy positions and our, the way we define our financing priorities, we are also entrenching corruption. Because when you deny your citizens uh, that, it's not just a question of human rights violations, but it's a serious, it's, it's serious corruption to deny citizens of, of, of their rights. Uh, finally, I do agree with the lady who mentioned that uh, the issue of the share to the county governments, I agree with you. In fact, um, I think that thing slipped because we had actually corrected it somewhere, but it slipped and found its way back into my document. You are right. It should be no less than 35%. Uh, because we also have to be rational. I've been in Treasury. And I know very well that you cannot, uh, at this point in time of our economy, just take all the money to the counties. Uh, we have to, in fact, even build a lot of capacity in those counties. Because uh, by the time the Auditor General is through, Kenyans will also be shocked at the level of theft that has taken place in the county governments. So it's not always about the national government, but even the county governments are causing havoc. So I, I think I'll conclude by asking uh, Senator Petonilawere to say something, because uh, you did touch about Parliament uh, and Senate, and maybe she has something to say there, or whatever she wants to say. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. I just want to touch on two issues. As you will look at the commissions that are in the 15 commissions in the Constitution, you may be tempted to merge some of them 
but I would like you to take caution, for example, the Commission on Administrative Justice and the Kenya Human Rights Commission. You may uh, be tempted to think that they are similar, but there's the CAJ Commission, what we call the Ombudsman's Office. It's very crucial, very underfunded, so you may be tempted to think they have no work and therefore should be matched with the Kenya Human Rights Commission, but they are very important. We should note that uh, Governor Waititu was impeached based on investigations by the CAJ. That alone tells us how important that uh, commission is, and we should fight and give it more funds so that it is properly devolved. The maladministration happening in counties would be greatly reduced if we empower the CAJ and not be tempted to merge it with the Kenya Human Rights Commission. The other one is on the national ethos creation. Uh, we need to develop a value system for this for this country, and it starts with our young people. As the Secretary General was saying, young people now <coughs> have a different value system, which is very unfortunate, and we are sort of mainstreaming bad manners into our operations. So I would like us to suggest that we introduce a subject called social education and ethics that was once there in our schools, so that our children grow up knowing what is expected of them, and that when they go out of uh, what is expected of them, they are uh, there, are, uh, there are consequences that are quite punitive. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh. uh, well, uh, I, I think I want to make a political statement now. For the reasons of doubt, uh, all those people who have been imagining that ANC is against this initiative, uh, forever hold your peace. Because what we wanted was dialogue and the, uh, an altercation or discussion that focuses on the issues and we move away from the personalities uh, because what we want to do must go beyond the personalities uh, at this stage in time or any time in future. We want a strong foundation for this country. Thank you. And, uh Honorable party leaders, they hold their peace. We have a tradition here, and this is not to doubt your serving as in ICT, but we have a tradition here, even as you go to clean your draft, that you always hand over to the chairperson what you presented. Our secretariat has printed for us the soft copy, so I can lend you this to hand over to me, or if you have one which has your signature, yes. I'll also receive it with your brother <laughs> here. And as the party leader of NC prepares, Kipra, get ready. We are not having any break. We want to finish everything now, so as ANC brings their presentation, Kipra, get ready. Oh, they are not saying that.
say that.